This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So, um, welcome everyone this evening. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Alice Woods to the Labs Alumnus Magazine's Research Summer of Term. Um, Alice is a lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, um, and she's just published, um, I'm going to hold it up, the fantastic Virginia Woolf's Light Cultural Criticism. Um, which takes a historicist and genetic approach towards 1930s work, providing a sensitive and nuanced exploration of Wolf's feminist politics. Um, Alice has also published articles on Wolf's interactions with the daily worker and the housekeeping, um, and her new work builds on this interest in creative histories and um, explores representations of modernity and nationhood in British women's magazines of the digital period. Um, and today, Alice will be speaking about all the past people. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you, too, for inviting me to be here. I'm really, really pleased to be here. And thanks to Chris as well. Um, I think it's a great idea, the Modernist Magazine's research seminar. I was really excited when you were telling me about it. And I'm sorry that I haven't actually managed to come to um, the ones before, but I hope I will next term. Um, I also feel a little bit embarrassed, I suppose I should say, first off to be at a seminar for modernist magazines talking about good housekeeping. Um, because probably if you've even opened a copy of good housekeeping, you may have noticed it is not a modernist magazine. So that is not going to be my argument at any point that it's a modernist magazine. Um, I'm just hoping that there might be some interesting things to say about it all the same in relation to modernism, and specifically in relation to Virginia Woolf. Um, so what I'd like to do with the session, um, first of all, I suppose, thinking about my, kind of my more recent project, which has led me to think a lot about how modernism, how we can explore responses to modernism in mass market magazines, I want to kind of begin by, by posing that question slightly, because I think it's important to build up to thinking about Wolf and Good Housekeeping. How do we approach modernist content? in mass market magazines. So I'll just say a little bit about that and that those questions, as I said, my, my current project that they, they kind of that's where it's come from. I'm working at the minute on um, on a book that looks at uh, approaches to modernism and printing of modernist content in five mass market uh, women's fashion and domestic magazines. Um, and uh, doing that, I've come across a number of sort of core kind of problems, I suppose, or questions associated with how we might survey modernism in this context and how reading modernism here is different to reading modernism in a modernist magazine. Um, so I'll start by saying a little bit about that. Um, I then want to talk a bit about, um, well, I suppose, uh, kind of good housekeeping itself what good housekeeping looks like in the 20s and the 30s at the time when Wolf is contributing. And that's building up, of course, to the main question that I want to sort of raise today, um, which is how, how does studying Wolf's good housekeeping articles in, their play, in the context of their first place in publication change our reading of them? How does it influence our reading of them? So, Wolf's Good Housekeeping articles, um, you may know, are more likely to be met as the London Scene. That collection um, published posthumously, bringing together Wolf's series of six essays surveying different views of London um, under the title The London Scene. Um, in fact, five of the essays were first brought together in 1975 with this title, and then 2004, the Snowbooks edition comes out, The London Scene, and then um, Natasha kindly informed me before today there's a new edition from Dawn Books, which Chris has in front of him. Um, so this is perhaps when most people are going to meet these essays and what they're going to imagine they're going to kind of read there comes in part of how they're packaged as a collection and the way they're labelled one scene, kind of as a whole, as an entity. Um, but how do we read them differently when we meet them here? in good housekeeping when we meet them in kind of a serial publication surrounded by all this other content, big business, a new novel by ASM Hutchinson. Um, what, what do we make of uh, these articles when we read them here? And I suppose my argument fairly obviously is going to be that reading these articles in good housekeeping is a much richer experience. It's what we should be doing. And I'm going to focus on the interactions between books and essays and the editorial feature and advertising content of good housekeeping. 
and hopefully I might take a breath enough that you could want to chuck things in as we go through that we might do that, that would be great. Because um, I've got lots of images of content and there might be things people want to say, so if there is, please say it. Um, okay. So I'll start then with this question of how do we approach modernism in mass market magazines and um, I want to go back to a quotation which Andrew Thacker evoked back in um, the first Modernist Magazine's research seminar which thanks to the wonderful podcast I was able to see. So that was quite handy. Um, and I saw that Andrew had uh, brought up this quotation um, from the second volume of uh, Booker and Thacker's Oxford Culture and Critical History of uh, Modernist Magazines as a way of raising that question of what is a Modernist Magazine, how did they define it for the purposes of those volumes, and how might we think about defining and discussing um, the kind of relation of modernism and magazines further. So I thought I'd bring up this quotation again in order to think about um, kind of the scope and the direction of our interactions with periodicals within modernist studies and where mass market magazines might fit within this field. So um, the quotation then is when, it's from the general introduction of the second volume and it's saying what the volume hopes to explore, uh, which is the complex role played by magazines in the construction of modernism. And centrally, this involves the study of little magazines, but also, as should be clear by now, significant numbers of other kinds of periodical in which modernism was promoted, debated and critiqued. And as someone who wants to um, work on a project with modernism in mass market magazines, I really like the end of this quotation. It's rather handy. Um, this idea of kind of magazines, other kinds of magazines in which modernism is promoted, debate, debated and critiqued, also being in some way kind of important to the construction of modernism to the canonisation of modernism, to our recep the reception of modernism, to our understanding what modernism is, that we can perhaps find um, mass market magazines also engaged in that debate. Um, so this quotation then, I mean, Booker and Packer's volumes are situating little magazines at the centre of modern modernist activity quite clearly. They're primary institutions of modernism, but they're also pointing towards the existence of a wider network of diverse periodicals um, in which uh, modernism features and which might also be important in some way to its construction. So while, as I've said, I've got no desire to try and situate um, Good Housekeeping as a modernist magazine, I uh, don't think I'd be particularly successful if I did, as we'll see as we look through some of its content, um, I am interested in this question of what role uh, British Good Housekeeping and Vogue and Modern Home and Eve might have played in the formation, the reception and the canonisation of modernism, of a modernist cultural aesthetic and, and kind of what was that role. Um, obviously I'm not going to try and address that question here but it's sort of in the back of my mind through some of the stuff I'm, I'm talking about. As I study these magazines um, and I'm sort of still reading through the actual, you know, the work of reading through the issues, um, it's becoming increasingly difficult, I'm finding, to make generalisations about the way in which each of these mass market periodicals interacted uh, with modernism because they do so in different ways and to a different extent. And in some ways, good housekeeping doesn't at first look like the best example. Um, literary modernism features very, very rarely in British good housekeeping. But the magazine does publish a significant number of writers who we now look back on and label modernist. Like Wolf, um, also Rebecca West, Storm Jameson, Rose McCauley. And the magazine also prints articles and reviews that respond diversely to modernist cultural outputs. So we can think about how that might be seen as a sort of secondary text, I suppose, to an early secondary text to modernism, kind of debating what modernism is and how it's received. And there remains, of course, a temptation for modernist scholars to cherry-pick modernist content in their interactions with mass market magazines. Um, and this is despite the insistence of periodical studies, um, that analysing a magazine requires analysis of that publication in its entirety, the entirety of an issue, or the entirety of a publication across issues. Um, and I'm very aware that the subject of today's seminar 
ostensibly sets just such a bad example. Virginia Woolf in Good Housekeeping, as if the rest of Good Housekeeping didn't matter. Um, I hope, I hope through the following analysis of Woolf's essays in Good Housekeeping, I will somehow also try and get closer to analysing more widely what was early British Good Housekeeping and how modernist aesthetics and outputs are mediated or can be mediated in that magazine um, through its regular content through its periodical codes. So we're not just looking at modernism as the extraordinary event where it appears in mass market magazines, but actually how it's part of the ordinary, how it's mediated through the regular content. That's a question that interests me. Right, okay, good housekeeping. So, Good Housekeeping then was an American import. Um, the British edition was launched uh, by Hearst's National Magazine Company in March 1922. You can see from the couple of covers I've put up here, uh, kind of immediately its domestic focus is very, very clear. Um, this is a, a magazine that nearly always the covers feature a sentimentalised portrait of a child or of a couple of children. Um, they're always smiling, they're always happy, their cheeks are always rosy, and there's always something to symbolise their kind of good health and well-being, be it the apple, be it the flowers, be it, aren't we running around? Look how healthy we are, look how well-nurtured we are, as if this, I think, is kind of the ultimate aim of all our good housekeeping. This is what it is for. Um, in terms of the purpose of this magazine, um, Good Housekeeping was one of a range of new magazines that um, begins to appear in Britain following the First World War, which seeks to reflect the radical social changes taking place for women in Britain at this time, and in particular, to meet the needs, or perhaps create needs, um, create a demand, of the increasing number of middle-class women who, due to the shortage of domestic staff, are now starting to do their own housework. Um, so that's the market to which good housekeeping is reaching out. And it's seeking to educate its readership in how to manage the family budget, it's um, providing meal plans, it's founding the Good Housekeeping Institute in 1924 with its famous Good Housekeeping seal of approval to guide readers to the best products for feeding, dressing and running a household. So Good Housekeeping, like many magazines still today, constructs cooking, cleaning, decorating, maintaining a home as kind of not just worthwhile occupations, but in fact kind of scientific occupations, scientific pursuits to be conducted with the maximum efficiency, the minimum waste, and with the use of the best possible new technologies. It's making housekeeping interesting, if such a task were possible. <laughs> and that is what good housekeeping is aiming to do. And I think because of that uh, sort of mingling together of... Um, of, of kind of editorial material, but also look at the best new technologies. There's a, a mingling there with commercial content. The magazine becomes very quickly an immediate financial success. I'll talk a bit more about commercial content later. Alongside all this domestic advice, good housekeeping also includes fashion, fiction, um, and it prides itself on paying attention to contemporary political and social issues as they affected women. And this is clear from uh, this editorial statement titled The Reason for Good Housekeeping, which appeared in the first issue in March 1922. So this is what Good Housekeeping aims to address. The daily life of women, what concerns them and interests them most profoundly and most intimately, what they talk about, think about and wish to read about in their favourite magazine will be the first concern of Good Housekeeping. The burning questions of the day will be reflected each month in articles by women in the public eye, known for their sound grasp of their subject, by women who can lead women and who are fearless, frank and outspoken. Women writers whose words are waited for and whose views are valued by other women all over the kingdom will be among our honoured contributors. One of the things I really like about this statement is the way in which um, it's framing so many sort of issues uh, to do with the daily life of women as it quite naturally coming together. I think there's a tendency when we look back at this magazine to think, oh, isn't it surprising that it should contain stuff about cleaning and stuff about politics? Isn't that surprising? Well, is it surprising? I mean, is, is, is 1922 somehow a very different 
different moment to now in which people can be political and don't have to hoover, or in which they can hoover and then they don't think about voting. I don't know. I mean, in fact, they weren't thinking about voting, all of them, but when they really wanted to, and perhaps that made it more urgent. So the daily life of women um, is constructed as something which involves housekeeping, but it's also what are you interested in, what do you want to talk about? And I've cut this, this quotation down, but it also makes reference to art, music, new trends in drama, um, sort of social issues, all sorts of kind of all sorts of things that are debated here, which are going to be important to good housekeeping. And I think another part of the quotation that's important to keep in mind is this idea of calling on women who are fearless, frank, and outspoken. A lot of the um, kind of previous uh, Wolf criticism around the London scene essays falls back on this idea that Wolf has had to dumb down her writing in some way to write for Good Housekeeping, that she sold her soul, um, that she couldn't have been political if she wanted, it wouldn't have been welcome. And when we actually start to look at the content of the magazine, much of it is far more fearless, frank, and outspoken than Wolf's articles. So that's not what's going on, something else is going on. So I think that's another thing that's worth remembering. So throughout the 20s and the 30s then, Good Housekeeping published essays from high-profile female and male writers on topics such as professions for women, the difficulties of married life, that crops up quite a lot, um, the workings and problems of government and the inequality of the sexes. The magazine is published monthly, it's priced at a shilling, um, which is, I mean, compared to modern home, modern home sixpence, it's kind of the cheap alternative. So good housekeeping is, uh, that gives us some idea maybe of where it's placed. It's a glossy colour, colour cover. It contains roughly 200 pages per issue. Um, and I only was able to give kind of a sample of content because the file would be so large in what was sent around before the seminar. But maybe I hope that gave you some idea of the, the kind of the format of the magazine. So you have a list of content a couple of pages of advertising, an opening poem, then about 75 advert-free pages with double spreads of articles and fiction um, and cookery and household and fashion um, segments. And then these features are continued in the latter half of the magazine on pages which are split between text and advertising. So overall, about 60% of the publication is taken over by commercial material. And the selling of advertising space is obviously a crucial factor to the magazine's financial viability. But what interests me, I suppose, is how advertising in good housekeeping also fulfills, fulfills part of the magazine's editorial project to educate its readers about new products, new housekeeping products. So although commercial um, advertising remains supplementary to and separate from the editorial material of the magazine, the presence of editorial features promoting and examining the benefits of different appliances and commodities blurs this distinction, I think, between advertising and content. Um, so here's one example. This is from the December 1931 issue. So it's, we're thinking about Christmas, as we all are now. Of course, practical presents will be appreciated this year more than ever. The Institute suggests household gifts that can be obtained through any of our ironmonger agents. See the complete list on page 189. So we've got little blurbs about all the different appliances that are uh, being shown here and why they're so good. This is kind of editorial material, but we're also being directed to who we can buy it from. It's the crossover, and perhaps it's worth pointing out some of the appliances we could buy. We could have an orange squeezer, we could have some lamps. That's quite boring, I suppose. More exciting than electric toaster. Um, I also really like this. This is an iron with a weird attachment pin for ironing ties. <laughs> so you can really look, who irons ties? Like, am I missing a trick? What is that? There's also a brush which has a comb inside. I'm not sure that gadget would impress my husband. I think he'd prefer an iPhone, but look, look at the gadget. It's a brush and a comb. Um, so anyway, these features I think are quite interesting in the way that they're bringing together editorial and commercial material. And every issue of Good Housekeeping also ends with an index to Good Housekeeping's guaranteed advert, um, adverts. Ah, uh, adverts. <laughs> Um, so you've got kind of you can look through and find all oh, china dress and pottery. Where's my hairdressing stockers? Oh, there's jewellery. There's heating and lighting, and cooking. So the magazine's also acting in some ways a kind of catalogue, and its adverts are actually part of the magazine's kind of purpose. They're searchable. Um, the advertising itself uh, tells us something about who who people thought might be 
reading the magazine, maybe. Uh, it certainly assumes an audience of middle class housewives concerned with the health, well being, and appearance of themselves, their children, and their home. In comparison, however, as I was saying about the kind of magazine's articles and its content, we're seeing a much broader range of topics covered from various angles. And this is in line with Good Housekeeping's early editorial plea that it will address the burning questions of the day. So we find kitsch stories mixing with regular features on current affairs. Um, that March 1932 issue includes um, Helena Normanton's The World As It Passes, uh, which is a regular feature on current affairs at the time. It appears every month kind of discussing disarmament or um, what's going on in France. Um, we've got knitting supplements mingling with literary criticism and reviews of highbrow writers. And in the, the, again, the March 32 issue circulated before today, we've got Beverly Nichols's inflammatory discussion of how the whole of Western civilization, um, as we know it, is a sinking ship, followed by an encyclopedia of cleaning. So I'm, I'm falling into the trap of doing what I said we shouldn't do, which is say, wow, look at all this stuff that's here. Um, and this content suggests a much more complex readership, maybe, than the advertising supposes. There's an article from Phyllis Peck on meals for the business girl in October 1932, suggesting to us that, um, you know, it's that the single working women as well as wives and mothers are reading this magazine. This broad range of content also significantly implies, um, what I think is really important, that Good Housekeeping's middle class readership has much more diverse concerns than often modern day critics quite patronisingly assume in their discussions of mass market magazines. Um, I'll take a, a sort of a moment then to run through some content now, I think, because it's nice to see some more images. I'll start with some images from the January 32 issue and, and then move on to a couple from the March 32. So this is from January 32. I quite like this double page spread just because it does illustrate exactly what I'm trying to say about kind of different readerships that you might imagine. On the left-hand side we've got an article about a career for the girl who likes books and can appreciate them as commodities, openings for women in publishers' advertising, and then on the right hand side we've got how to bring babies successfully through teething. So these things are going on together, um, as indeed, don't they all waste. Um, we've got an article from Violet Bonham Carter who writes regularly for Good Housekeeping through the 20s and the 30s. This is Democracy in the Melting Pot. I really like this article actually, it's really interesting. It could probably apply now. She's talking about um, why is there all this apathy amongst the voting public? We spent the whole of the 19th century campaigning for this vote, all the way up to the war we wanted this vote, and now we've got it. We've just had a really important general election in 1931 after the Labour government collapsed, and everyone was really apathetic, and everyone says these parties don't represent us, and why doesn't anybody care? You wanted this vote, now use it. And she sort of says that, well, actually, uh, kind of political apathy is far more dangerous to democracy than political violence. So, yes, uh, Bonham Carter, I think we'll go with that. Uh, it's quite an interesting article there. Lots of, uh, I like the picture at the bottom is from sort of pre World War I, and we've got a big banner saying, Shall the people be ruled by the peers? And this is contrasted with a picture at the top from um, the 1931 election with a well, I don't know, I'm so impressed that that many people are out and listening to what <laughs> politicians got to say, but maybe that's just me. But they do look a bit more apathetic, like they're not really listening, so I suppose that's the contrast you're trying to make. This is the article in which Walks Oxford Street Tide also appears, I'll come back to that. Something on fashion, the well-dressed woman, shoes with London clothes, give you an idea of kind of the style of the illustrations. Creole cookery. And some adverts, as I said, are always about kind of health and appearance of family and home. So we've got maternity frocks, baby carriages, your old silver made just like new, hats cleaned and remodeled free, uh, Glaxo builds bonnie babies. And I really like um, up here <laughs> living out in the suburbs isn't enough if your husband is bringing home colds from the city. It's always good to be warm. I've no idea what the Rico finally is, which I, I probably should have Googled that before. Um, very ignorant, but apparently that's what you need in the suburbs. If you're going to go anywhere near those cities, you don't know what you're going to catch. I, like, I, I kind of like that captures a moment, sort of evolving suburbia and what it means to this particular readership, or at least what the advertisers think it might be. 
couple of the articles that uh, were formerly run for Winfrey Colby on the Sable standard, the idea of, um, kind of uh, upper middle classes wanting to keep up appearances. Um, and it's, you know, as long as you're living in the right area and wearing the right furs, uh, that's what's important, never mind the fact that actually you can't really afford all that. And why don't you just move yourself out to the suburbs and just <laughs> accept the kind of class drop that that implies and live a lot better? Why don't you just do that? Um, and then this article, I don't know if anyone actually had a look at this, I think it's just, um, it's, well, it's mad. <laughs> um, and Nichols is studying black and it, sort of extremely pessimistic, sort of reactionary article about everything that's wrong with the world ever, full of kind of misogyny and racism and all sorts. Uh, very bizarre, but certainly frank and outspoken, if <laughs> not written by one of the famous women of the day, but never mind. But Nichols is a really odd figure. I tried to look him up on the Oxford um, kind of Dictionary of National Biography, or whatever it's called, and uh, it told me that he was most famous for writing something about gardening. I was like, but this is weird. And then he also for a while thought fascism was a good idea and he was a very prominent in the Liberal Party and then he thought communism was the way. So I mean, he does seem to be someone who was always, uh, oh, what's the new, next, next new thing? Very strange. Um, um, I don't know, has anyone got anything they want to say about any of the content or share reactions, reflections? How common was it to have such extreme political articles? Or was the political content quite um, middle of the road? Yeah. A long time or does, does this article kind of strike you as being quite uh, uh, it, the the racism strikes yeah. me in it, but the, um, in other ways, no. It's quite common to have strident political articles. It's quite common also to have quite misogynist articles um, mm -hmm. alongside um, feminists writing quite strongly for equality for the sexes. There's a lot of contradictory political opinions in that way. Um, but I think this did strike me just because of the sort of, you know, do you like Indians? I don't. What? <laughs> Where does that come from? Um, that is quite striking. Uh, but Nichols writes a couple of articles as well later in 1932, which even um, put in completely contrary opinions. So he's sort of contradictory with himself. It's very odd. Yeah. I'm wondering, do you, do you know what the response of the readers was at all? Is, is there a kind of letters to the editor page? Or ah, and helpfully, uh, there isn't a letters to the editor page. I don't know what there is in terms of archive. I haven't explored the idea of readers' responses, but um, Fiona Hackney's done quite a bit of work on that. I'm not sure um, sort of what might be available, but that might be worth exploring. She's certainly um, been thinking about responses readers' responses and what these magazines meant to readers. Mm -hmm. I suppose I've focused on kind of what the what the content looks like rather than the readers' response. The, the bit you do get, maybe it's readers writing in, I'm not sure, is the health questionnaire. I should have scanned a bit of the health questionnaire, which is fab, if only because the ones that really intrigue you where they don't print the letter of people writing you've got wrong, they just give you like, take the cream and rub it. <laughs> 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 Protecting the modesty. <laughs> that amuses me. <laughs> but that's not really about what they thought about the magazine, I know. <laughs> um, the illustrations are absolutely fantastic. But I was interested that there are very few author photos, unlike in a magazine today where you get a little kind of biography and photo. Um, except for Violet, Violet Bonham Carter, and I just wondered if there's a certain concurrency in having celebrity writers. I don't know, but that. There, or yes. is it just a rotating cast of writers? There's the rotating cast and then there's also people who are brought in to be the celebrity. But you're right, it's, it is um, quite striking, the lack of photos. It's actually quite unusual, as I said, by the one part of writes for um, good housekeeping quite a lot. And it's not you know, the case that she has photos always there. Which is, look at that again. It's quite weird. Yeah. Very deep, but the, um, that does match. There is there is certainly a celebrity culture going on within the magazine um, that that we can kind of pick up in the often in the editorial billing about the author who's there and the way in which they're placed, um, and also in kind of some of the more like uh, reviews of writers and stuff. Uh, 
that kind of places people more as celebrities. But you're right, it's perhaps odd that they don't capitalise more on having pictures. Do you know if the Sable standard is a sort of current term or is it has it been invented for the article? That's a question I really want to show the answer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, th I, been, I, I haven't been able to find it, but that's something I was also wondering about. She's, she's takes quite a long time building it up in the first two paragraphs, so I wonder whether she's yeah, come up with it. Well. Um, but I don't know the answer. Funny one. And the, the picture that goes with that is a funny one too. I don't quite know what to make of that. The masks and the skeleton behind is quite harrowing. <laughs> More harrowing than the article. Yeah, that's really and it's got, at the bottom, it's got Lady something, which I don't know if, it's, if that's a reference to the Lady oh, yes. magazine. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I think you've got lady, you've got son, I guess. Oh, I see. So, she, so she's, she's, a lady. she's a lady something, and she's not going to let go of her, mm. her title, I suppose, and her face, despite the fact that everything's crumbling behind. I like the idea of the kind of cut out of fruit of the food as well. There's mm. comments in the article about, okay, you haven't got any servants, there's no one to cook for you, you don't have to do it yourself, but you just won't give in and move somewhere cheaper. And then uh, Wolf is writing, and we know that from her diary and her letters, between February and April of that year. The series is then published, as you can see, between December 31 and December 32. Um, just briefly give you an idea of the essays. So the Docks of London takes the reader town to the Thames to look at the utilitarian commercial practices of the Docklands, Oxford Street Tide. Um, in this article we've got Wolf's narrator celebrating the transiency and the superficiality, um, celebrating the mass in London's most famous uh, shopping street, or I think she also calls it London's least distinguished thoroughfare. <laughs> Great Men's Houses um, is the article from March 32 issue in which uh, the narrator is touring the former homes of Thomas Carlyle and John Keats, so it's kind of an article that's I suppose a bit cultural tourism. Um, Abbeys and Cathedrals explore St Paul's and Westminster Abbey. This is the House of Commons. It's a kind of outsider's tour of the House of Commons, or the Houses of Parliament. So um, the narrator's kind of constructing this tour as someone who doesn't know the place um, for the reader. And then Portrait of a Londoner um, is a kind of an odd essay within the series in that it doesn't seem to kind of fit in terms of genre, it feels quite different. Um, we move from the public arena into the private sphere with a quite anecdotal portrayal of this fictional cockney hostess who is Crows. There's a kind of turn away from the real world and back into some strange fictional past we don't quite know where to place. Um, and that, so I suppose the last thing that I'll come to is trying to make some sense of what is that essay because <laughs> uh, that's the question that first hit me when I was <coughs> Importantly, um, the collective title 
for these essays, the London scene is editorial, it would seem, rather than authorial. So um, I'm making that assumption on the basis that uh, supplied as a header for the second and the third essays within Good Housekeeping, but it wasn't there for the Docks of London in December 1931, and the London scene, that um, header has been dropped for the fourth, fifth, and sixth essays. Um, I quite like the way as well, by the time you get to the sixth essay, I don't I'm trying to remember, but I think Wolf's name might not even be on the front of the cover anymore, it's kind of its old hat now. Oh. Yeah, she was right for us. <laughs> Whatever, it's shoved in towards the back. And that happens quite a lot with um, celebrity writers that they have, but the first few contributions are a really big deal, and then it's, oh yeah, never mind, put it later. We've got something more that's new and exciting, we won't pull in the punters with that anymore. Um, so this, this title then, The London Scene, which has become which has become the title given to the collected editions, it's become the way in which we think about these essays, it shapes the way in which we read them as modern readers, um, and yet it doesn't really seem to have been what Wolfe had in mind. Um, and another thing that we need to think about too, I think here, is the rhythm of their original publication. Um, these essays are published very sporadically, uh, one essay every one, two or three months, it's kind of varying, there's no um, sort of reg regularity here. Um, I doubt Wolf would have had any con kind of uh, knowledge of how they were particularly going to be published, but she would certainly have expected them to be published in a serial, of course, in some sense, and this would have shaped the process of reading that she would expect her readers to encounter. Um, so I think that's important for us to remember that these es essays written specifically for serial journal publication, they're essays that present not one coherent scene, but rather a collection of contradictory visions of London past and present. Um, so I guess kind of what I've argued then in my article in Pro Studies is that we need to restore something of good housekeeping to these essays in order to kind of, in our interpretation, bring out some of their nuances. Um, that the linguistic content of the series may be identical in each version, but to read these essays in an edition of the London Scene is not the same as to read them within Good Housekeeping. So, it, as I said, it's difficult to kind of work out what happens in terms of the commission, particularly what happens in the, com the commission of these um, essays, and it's also difficult to determine with what expectations Wolfe came to write for Good Housekeeping. There's no surviving correspondence relating directly to the initial commission. Um, the only correspondence that does survive is to her agent, Curtis Brown, so it seems like everything has been kind of um, organised through an agent. So whether she's been invited to submit these essays or whether they, the agent has approached and then they've been accepted, it's not quite clear. Um, but what we do have is the first reference to these essays in her diary, I think it's 17th of February, she says, and I'm to write six articles straight off about what? Question mark. So it's clear that from Wolf's point of view, she's given this commission, but she's not told what the subject is. You've got six articles for going to housekeeping, go. Um, but the subject isn't prescribed. So that begs the question, I suppose, if she was approached by the magazine, in what capacity did they commission her? Um, what did they expect her to provide, um, when having had that negotiation with her agent? Um, and we can't know exactly the answer, but it is interesting, I think, that in 1931, at this time, Good Housekeeping is being edited by Alice Maud Head. Head is quite a remarkable character. She had become the first woman to run a publishing company in Britain at the age of 29 when she took on the editor and directorship of Good Housekeeping in 1924, I think it was. Um, during Head's 15 years of Good Housekeeping, she endorses the commission of articles for many prominent feminists and female politicians, um, so people like Milton Fawcett, Ellen Wilkinson. Um, so Wolf, we could think, might have been invited to appear in that role of a prominent feminist, and yet it seems quite clear that she hasn't been invited in that role. She doesn't seem to have been approached to write the magazine in that capacity. Although A Room of One's Own is mentioned periodically within the articles of Good Housekeeping around this time, she doesn't have that reputation as a feminist. Um, her reputation instead seems to be that of um, kind of a renowned member of the cultural elite, the, the status of a celebrity writer, I suppose. Um, and so if we think about kind of what Wolf was expected to provide, I, I think that must have been Good Housekeeping's expectation, that they were looking to capitalise on Wolf's fame. 
By the early 30s, there remains a kind of aura of exclusivity around Bloomsbury in good housekeeping, despite some growing contempt from uh, younger contributors on occasion. Uh, Wolf still appears as an exalted figure in the magazine's Ladies of Letters series in April 32, which reveals as well that this article is something of the magazine's scepticism towards modernist aesthetics. So um, this review of kind of Wolf's works, her early novels are celebrated in detail, but her experimental fiction is um, surveyed somewhat briskly, very much at arm's length. Um, there's really very little to be said about anything that doesn't look like a novel we recognise. Um, so it's quite interesting that this sort of d d dismissive attitude, I suppose, to more experimental fiction, and as perhaps in a magazine that's so focused on the practical that perhaps isn't so surprising. To the reviewer, the fact that Wolf is the daughter of Leslie Stephen is at least as important as her writing. She's very much kind of someone who's being written, uh, written about as a celebrity, and that celebrity image is reflected too in the fascination with her private life in this article. So there's a um, kind of imagining of Wolf in the country where we're told, um, quote, one of her chief occupations is keeping off callers, unquote. And I'm not sure how we would know that, but apparently the reviewer says with great authority that's what she does. Um, so this figuring of Wolf as an isolated celebrity, Eastby, tells us much about her popular reputation at this point, which is very interesting, and also about some of the assumed shared attitudes of the magazine's readership. Interestingly, in her articles for Good Housekeeping, Wolf doesn't kind of directly sort of reject or seek to contradict this representation of her. Although we might say by depicting her narrator in predominantly urban public spaces, she is doing something to undermine that reception, um, that, that reputation that she has as a recluse. At the same time, however, Wolf is also maintaining a distance throughout between herself and uh, while between her narrator, kind of a version of herself, and the crowds around her through her role as an observer. So she's within the mass, but she's never one of the mass. She also owns her class status by highlighting um, that she has a kind of private income and ample leisure time that one would need to go wandering about London without any purpose. Um, and the glossy kind of sleek prose style she adopts is camouflaging her feminist politics while flirting, I think, with her reputation in this magazine as a gifted but slightly out of touch celebrity writer. And we can see this positioning in the editorial billing that accompanied Wolf's first essay. I doubt you can make it out, but at the top there it says that this is first in a gallery of scenes made vividly alive by the brilliant pen of Virginia Woolf. Um, and the word brilliant there, I think, is what I'm picking up on as giving that sense of someone uh, who's very, very gifted, but perhaps there's a kind of emptiness behind that. It's just brilliant. We're not, there's not, you know, sort of, there's no kind of description of, of why of why it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. Um, and this feeling also evokes Wolf's own description of these articles in a letter to Ethel Smith, in which she said they were pure, brilliant description with not a thought for fear of clouding the brilliancy. Again, she's picking up, um, I, I think, kind of reflecting the way in which she's trying to write these articles, um, that they would have the impression, at least, of not a thought for fear of cloud and brilliancy, that they'll fit that particular perception. Um, of course, I'm not going to say I think these articles don't have a thought in them, um, and certainly lots of critics have pointed out that they do, and have recognised quite detailed political and social analysis beneath the lyrical narrative here. Um, so they, the essays have been read variously uh, by Susan Squire as a feminist reclamation of the patriarchal city, by Sunita Sarkar as a kind of uh, patriotic portrayal of Englishness, and uh, I think very perceptively by Jeanette McVicker as an exploration of neo-imperialist commodity capitalism. Reading these essays within their original place of publication, what I think we find is that Wolf's pseudo travel log cunningly seems to suggest the need for a re-evaluation of British housekeeping at a domestic and a national level. So the first two essays consider the choices of the individual consumer against the operations of commercial business. The third and the sixth essays present the workings and failings of the domestic households of Keats, Carlyle, and the fictional Mrs. Crowe. 
while the fourth and fifth essays investigate the changing roles of England's institutional households, the Houses of Parliament and the Church. Um, and there's lots of themes here that might be worthy of some exploration, but I thought I'd sort of try and limit myself to a couple and then if other people have things they want to bring up in discussion, they, they, then we might do it in that way. So the themes I wanted to think about are those which can, can be read really fruitfully in the context of good housekeeping, that of the female consumer and commodity capitalism, I and mean, we've talked quite a bit about the commercial content in this magazine, so I'll just pick up on what Wolf has to say about commercialism and how that, um, about consumerism, sorry, and how that fits. Um, also the idea of monuments and the modern city, um, these essays are all very uh, dismissive, um, I suppose, of the idea of monumentalising individuals or monumentalising buildings or building monuments of that whole practice of kind of preserving a cultural heritage, of always being concerned with legacy, that's debated all the way through. And that's something that's quite interesting to read in the context of a magazine that's uh, full of celebrity culture. Um, well, full of is probably overstating it, but it's here. Um, and that also kind of leads to a theme about uh, the relationship between the individual and mass culture, which, which features in these essays too. So I'll start by thinking about um, the female consumer, and the first two essays, as I've said, parallel, uh, kind of present parallel analysis of um, contemporary consumer culture. So in the Docks of London, Wolf considers the global production and distribution of goods, while in Oxford Street Time, she depicts the high street apparatus for marketing and selling these commodities to the consumer. So in the Docks of London then, um, it opens with a portrayal of London as a quite sort of uninspiring, I think, um, crumbling industrial uh, imperial capital. Um, and the, uns the uninspiringness of the article, I think, is well matched by these etchings, I have to say, which are very dark and a little bit gloomy. Um, the essay then focuses on the commercial value system that rules the Docklands, kind of efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Um, everything's about making the maximum amount of money out of the minimum amount of work. Um, and then the essay closes, the, the, the point I want to focus on, with the reflection that, quote, our tastes, our fashions, our needs, unquote, are what shape the workings of commerce. So that final reflection, I think, is so interesting, that um, urging the reader to consider her potential power, I suppose, as a consumer, that what you buy impacts on this whole world of global trade. And this commentary, of course, it's really provocatively in Good Housekeeping due to the magazine's commercial content. The practice of splitting articles, printing half in the main editorial section and the final paragraphs amongst the advertising, means that um, Wolf's assertion about the female consumer's power um, appears in a very conflicted context. So at the same time as her narrator is suggesting that the only thing that can change the routine of the docks is a change in ourselves, um, we've got brash slogans attempting to manipulate the reader to buy um, with kind of which side of your carpet is wearing out. Look, Connie, delicious cod liver oil. Um, so at the same time that the article is telling us, it's your choice, it's your choice, it's your choice, we're also being hit with, come by, come by, come by. Um, the essay also in, in concludes a little point that kind of uh, plays on the reader's potential ignorance about where their goods come from, the origins of their goods. Uh, it's revealed to us that, quote, if you buy an umbrella or a looking glass not of the finest quality, it is likely that you are buying the tusk of a brute that roams through Asian forests before England was an island. So there's this whole description of a pile of mammoth tusks and, and what they're going to be put to, and there's a play on the idea that kind of by another cultural value system, a mammoth tusk should be really highly prized, it should be in a museum somewhere, why is it making the, an umbrella handle, why is it making the backs of kind of looking glasses of not the finest quality? At the same time as this criticism, we've got footers along the bottom of the page reassuring the reader that advertised goods are good goods. I really like that phrase, advertised goods are good goods. And all advertisements in good housekeeping are guaranteed. So the essay's kind of interaction then with, these mag with the magazine's internal periodical codes 
I think is inviting the reader to question their trust in advertised products and also to question their knowledge about where the goods they buy come from and what kind of goods they might want to buy. Uh, I, I don't know if I go as far as saying this is about ethical shopping, but we're, we're kind of getting there a little bit. Um, and good housekeeping seems a particularly appropriate place to remind consumers of their potential power, to, to kind of empower the reader consumer. So while, good, oh, sorry, while the docks of London reminds readers of their potential ignorance, um, about the origins of the goods they purchase, Oxford Street Tide um, takes a very different approach. This essay very much celebrates the transformative processes that turn raw materials into a dazzling array of consumables to gratify the shopper. And there's even that illustration happens. This strange guy with the tortoise. <laughs> I don't know. But this, this looks quite inviting, the lines. I think the, the, the illustration works well there. So this essay is the first to be headed in Good Housekeeping with the London scene. We get the London scene 2 at the top there. And it might be worth for a moment just thinking about what, why that head is used and what it suggests. Um, and I think the idea of a London scene, the idea of a scene, particularly with the editorial Billings allusion to the name of this distinguished author, Virginia Woolf, might set up an expectation, I suppose, of some sort of cultural elitism, some uh, uh, kind of the literary circles of London. This is what we're going to get, uh, get an outlook on, that London scene, some sort of elite. And it's quite nice, I think, that the contrast we have then, that the essay focuses instead on the garishness, the gaudiness of the great rolling ribbon of Oxford Street. So the essay instead takes us to the shopping ground for the masses. It's certainly not perhaps the elitist London scene that the title might suggest. Um, so Oxford Street is negotiated in the essay by um, our outsider narrator. And she surveys with a certain amount of ambivalence, I think, the bargains, the sales, the goods marked down to one and eleven three that only last week cost two and six. She maintains a slightly critical outlook um, on this commercial activity. She's distanced from it, she doesn't buy, is the main point there, I suppose. But at the same time, there's a lot less kind of uh, critical weight given to the narrator's perspective in this essay in comparison to the Docks of London. And that's partly because she invents the figure of the moralist who can be the one who says all the kind of dismissive things, while the narrator can delight in this space and what it offers. Um, so the narrator responds, in fact, very positively to this image of the modern city, saying that its charm is that it's not built to last, it is built to pass. So the kind of superficiality that goes with a modern consumer throwaway culture is being um, celebrated here. Modern department stores are compared favourably with aristocratic mansions, and Oxford Street is constructed as a kind of democratic space in which modern Londoners can build for ourselves and for our own needs. And this is a feature that Wolf um, implicitly connects with, um, with high modernist aesthetics, I think, with the, with the reference to how building for ourselves is a driving impulse behind invention, creation, and fertility. They're the adjectives she uses there. Um, and I think that kind of link between the liveliness of consumer culture and perhaps a drive for um, newness for experimentalism is also highlighted nicely by the illustration that accompanies um, the essay in Good Housekeeping. This is S.G. Bowman, I think that's how you say his name. Striking kind of black and white illustration. Uh, angular shapes, crisp lines, very much evocative of modern styles of design. Um, so celebrating this moment of the now and of the new. So Wolf seems to be suggesting in Oxford Street Tide, I think, then, that despite the potential criticisms of consumer culture, um, one of the things that's great about the modern city is that it's free from this burden of preserving its history, of building a legacy, and instead it continually reconstructs itself in response to the needs of the present. That's something that's being really kind of positioned as this is the modernist impulse to build for the needs of now. And that leads us on, I think, to think about the theme of monuments uh, within these essays. And the, the tension between past and present is a recurring theme, too, in great men's houses, in abbeys and cathedrals, and this is the House of Commons and in Portrait of a Londoner. 
So Wolf moves away from the homogenised consumer culture of Oxford Street to enter the memorialised homes of Carlisle and Keats, to visit the celebrated public figures enshrined in Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral and in statues in the Houses of Parliament, and then finally offers a sentimental portrait of the private figure, the figure of the angel in the house in Mrs Crow. Each of these essays discloses a strong aversion to the 19th century practice and monumentalising people and things, while at the same time exploring society's desire for public heroes and heroines. There's an ambivalence there. Um, kind of thinking about why is it that we want celebrities to idolise, to gossip about. And Wolf's unease in these essays with society's desire to elevate selected individuals, usually male, and the qualities by which they're judged to be great, to evaluate those, is very pertinently addressed to readers familiar with the idolisation of famous individuals in good housekeeping celebrity homes and gossip style features. So I want to now put alongside each other Great Men's Houses and a Home of Poets, um, two articles that feature together in the March 1932 issue. So Great Men's Houses um, mimics the format of Good Housekeeping's frequent features on the homes of famous people or former homes of famous people. There are examples of these, these kinds of articles throughout Good Housekeeping around this time, either visiting the space of a living famous person and imagining this is where she sits and drinks her tea, wow! Or former homes, a kind of a cultural tourism um, that's coming in here too. So um, in the same issue we've got this article, A Home of Poets, which describes the residence of Algernon Swinburne and Theodore Watts Dunton with photographs to show how Mrs Watts Dunton has recently adapted the old house to modern requirements. Um, and Wolfe's essay, in terms of the, kind of the, the linguistic content that's there in terms of the text, superficially conforms to this framework of a celebrity homes or cultural tourism feature of this type by describing the interiors of the former homes of Carlisle and Keats. Um, this reception, this kind of way of reading the essay, is promoted even further by the editorial arrangement of Wolf's article and the photographs that accompany it within Good Housekeeping. You can see how similar the two features look and the way they've been kind of arranged. Once we actually get into reading the essay, of course, we find um, that actually it's quite different. Um, the essay's depiction of the domestic arrangements of Carlyle's former home soon strikes the reader as very much less celebratory in tone. Carlyle's house is portrayed as a dismal Victorian space, uh, lit by yellow shafts of London light and everywhere marked by the signs of the daily battle that mistress and maid fought with dirt and cold for cleanliness and warmth. So Wolf satirises Carlyle's living conditions with Dickensian detail. We've got Carlyle groaning as he wrestles with his history on a horsehair chair. We've got Mrs. Carlyle coughing in the large four-poster hung with maroon curtains in which she was born, like she never got out of this house. And one unfortunate maid toiling to serve the two most um, nervous and exacting people of their time. And by highlighting these discomforts, absurdities, and oppressive domestic arrangements of Carlyle's home, she's encouraging a uh, reassessment of both Carlyle's life and also the 19th century kind of value system that has inspired the preservation of his home as a kind of cultural shrine. What is it a shrine to? To this poor maid running up and down the stairs, going, I just can't bring in enough water. I mean, what is being enshrined? As the essay moves on to uh, visit the former home of Keats, I think it's the contrast which is important here. So there's a very sentimental portrayal of Keats' home in the suburb of Hampstead, which serves to highlight the negative description of Carlisle's Chelsea house um, and the patriarchal power it symbolises. So while the urbanised home of the Carlisles is a tyrant to be fought against, Keats' residence is presented as a little green plot. It's not cluttered with heavy furniture, it doesn't have that Victorian feel. Um, it's furnished rather with light and shadow than with chairs and tables. So Wolfe depicts Keats's cottage as a pre-industrial refuge from the traffic of life, in which the owner was able to sit on the chair in the window and turn his page without haste, though his time was short. 
I think, I mean, this idyllic refuge is being marked out as a kind of irretrievable fantasy of a pre-industrial era there by that reference to the former owner's tragic early demise. And the essay closes by replacing the monumental figures of Carlyle and Keats with the ordinary, with the democratic, and returning kind of to the everyday. What the essay closes with is the image of the narrator walking up um, onto Parliament Hill and seeing on a bench the usual young man clasping to his arms the usual young woman. So after all this kind of exploration of these monumentalised figures, what we come back to is life goes on. Let's look out over London now. Um, let's look at the usual young man and the usual young woman. Wolf's critique of the, the practice of making monuments of individuals is further extended in abbeys and cathedrals. Touring St Paul's Cathedral, Wolf's narrator contemplates the dignified reposing room to which great statesmen and men of action retire, noting Nelson looks a little smug. And that portrayal, of course, um, tells us straight away her a reverent attitude towards Nelson and his smugness. Um, the essay then shifts to Westminster Abbey and depicts its kings and queens, poets and statesmen. And here the narrator cannot help questioning whether it is, quote, through their virtues that these dead have come here. She says, often they have been violent, often they have been vicious. Often it is only the greatness of their birth that has exalted them. And I quite like that too, because it makes me think of the, the review Lady of Letters of Wolf again. And maybe it's the greatness of her birth that has exalted her. That she's such, not, not that she's writing directly in response to that, but it's the same impulse that she's kind of having a stab at. In This is the House of Commons, Wolf's fifth good housekeeping essay. Um, the narrator openly calls for us to give up making statues and inscribing them with impossible virtues. Um, I have to apologise for the image. I haven't got a scan of This is the House of Commons in Good Housekeeping. That's actually a, an image of the proof. But I wanted to put it up there just because it shows you the illustration which was put next to um, the article, which is just fab. I love it. You've got these enormous statues of politicians on top of the Houses of Parliament. Um, as I say, the, what actually Wolf saying in the essay is, first of all, let's get rid of those statues. She says, let us rebuild the world then as a splendid hall. Let us see whether democracy which makes halls cannot surpass the aristocracy which carves statues. So first there's this big call for kind of democracy. Um, but then there's a kind of slide back into, um, well, first of all, the point that the idea that democracy hasn't yet been achieved is quite interesting in Wolf's essay, This is the House of Commons. Um, she is writing at the moment at which finally men and women do have equal um, kind of rights to the vote. And yet she depicts the Houses of Parliament as somewhere where there are no women, where the only person she meets is this strange blue policeman who kind of tries to keep her from going anywhere within the building. This is contrasts with, it's very different from um, Molly Hamilton's essay, Mother of Westminster, which is in the March 1932 issue. Um, in which we've got a tour by an insider um, in which we detail how many women are in Parliament. And there is kind of a call within Hamilton's essay about, like, there should be more. But there is a recognition that this is a democratic space, whereas Wolfe's essay seems to be still talking about the House of Parliament as if it isn't a democratic space. That's an anomaly, but perhaps an anomaly that, that kind of makes sense if we think about kind of her... her feminist criticism of the values which are still ruling Parliament um, and kind of it seems to be a call that actually we need to do more, <laughs> democracy isn't quite here. So despite all the talk as well of kind of communal space and democratic values, the reader, the, sorry, the narrator also cannot quite give up her learned practices of hero worship in the essay. She admits at the close of This is the House of Commons that the mind, it seems, loves the flashing eye, the arched brow, the abnormal, the particular, the splendid human being. So despite this kind of strong criticism then of an aristocratic value system by which past eras have made monuments of individuals, Wolfe continues to harbour anxieties, it seems, in these essays about the loss of individualism in a democratic society and the standardising influence of modern mass culture. So this essay might be put interestingly alongside Oxford Street Tide, though, I think. In a sixth and final good housekeeping, then, Portrait of a Londoner, Wolfe continues the theme of the loss of individuality in modern London by monumentalising one ordinary figure. 
So we move into the private drawing room of the true Cockney, Mrs. Crow, and um, again, unfortunately, I don't have a scan of this image, but um, what's striking about the essay and Bukowski thing is we get colour, we get a kind of red and grey illustration, and it's not particularly colourful, I'll grant you, but red, I mean, that's a step forward, that's quite exciting. Um, and what the illustration presents is a drawing room scene with an archetypal Victorian hostess and five other figures waited on by a maid. So it's, if you can imagine that particular scene. Um, and red is important there too, I think, to the kind of sentimentalised tone of the essay. It's very kind of cosy, uh, the way in which the, the colour scheme works. Perhaps surprisingly, Wolf's Victorian heroine is um, slightly irreverently, but also affectionately described in this essay. It's tied to the home, and more particularly to her armchair by the fire from which she poured out tea. She's a master of etiquette-bound conversation, which she sees must be general and about everything, because if it were too deep or too clever, somebody was sure to feel out of it and to sit balancing his teacup saying nothing. Wolf kind of pokes fun at such shallow talk um, and the conventions which required it with her description of how if anyone said a brilliant thing, it was felt to be rather a breach of etiquette, an accident that one ignores, like a fit of sneezing or some catastrophe with a muffin. Um, I like the way the prose seems to take on sort of like an Austin-like syntax. It's, I, I don't even know what era we're going back to here. It's quite interesting. Um, so it's, it's very much it's an affectionate satire that we find here. And just despite that satire of the restrictive lifestyle and the social crows that Mrs. Crow represents, the essay closes with sadness at her death. So it closes with the statement, Mrs. Crow is dead and London, no, though London still exists, London will never be the same city again. And like that just seems so odd when to kind of come across this essay, um, written a couple of months after Wolfe gives her speech on professions for women um, to the junior council of the London and National Society for Women's Service, in which she talks about, I had to kill the angel in the house, and then here she is writing this really sentimental kind of discussion of that figure. It's very odd. Um, one way I think of making sense of that is to read the last essay as a pair with This is the House of Commons. So the two essays can be read together as an evocation of women's newfound freedoms and responsibilities now they have entered the <coughs> political arena and also kind of what their role was and now that that's gone. That, so the archetypal hostess is that was then. It's sentimental because that you know, I kind of suppose emphasises that this is the past. This is now. This is where we've got to. Um, so I think um, what's happening in the last essay is that freedom that women have now found is surveyed with some ambivalence, um, partly because the demise of Mrs. Crow is associated with the loss of order. It's associated with a loss of sense of definite purpose um, with which women were born a generation earlier. You, you knew you had to be back by five to pour that tea. Like, I mean, if you were a certain class, that was what had to happen, as Wolf comments upon and rails about at length in her diary. Um, and that, with that kind of loss of purpose, I think um, she's suggesting in this essay, she's acknowledging that women face kind of a challenge, a challenge in structuring their own future, of making choices, of making choices perhaps from some of all those choices that are presented in good housekeeping. Do you like books and you have, can also see them as commodities? Maybe you want a career in this. Do you like um, the articles on kind of careers in engineering, careers in journalism, all sorts of kind of possibilities opening up. The absence of Mrs. Crow is also accompanied by the loss of her servant, which I think has to be important. The last paragraph tells us that Maria now does not open the door. And this detail reminds the reader again of the changing roles for women in the post-war period, um, with the number of women entering domestic service declining, but also because other career opportunities are opening up to working class women at this point, and bringing about a change in the lifestyle too, of course, for the archetypal middle class hostess, who now presumably is doing her own hoovering. If you've got a hoover, wow, that's an exciting new thing. I wonder what Queen says I should buy there. Um, so the close of her London scene series then, I think, is about playfully reminding um, the middle class good housekeeping readership that they face the simultaneously daunting and liberating task of choosing their own future and of course of doing their own housework. Um, so the stable gender roles of the old city have now been replaced by the flexibility, the transiency and the freedom of the new. Okay, 
Okay, so I'll kind of draw to a close, I suppose, what um, I, I pulled out there in that analysis that I hope other people might have much more interesting things to say. Um, and so I'm reading Good Housekeeping then as a perfect vehicle for Wolf's cultural criticism, as somewhere which is in no way a place that her cultural criticism had to be dumbed down, but actually in which there's an audience ready and waiting for exactly the kind of points that she's making. Reflected their, reflecting their intended serious publication, I'm noting the way in which Wolf omits to present a clear critical viewpoint in this series, um, and, and reading them instead as kind of essays which draw a likeness of the city to which she has access, and outlining the changes that she's witnessed as a woman in the social, political, and economic centre of patriarchal and imperialist Britain. And the various interactions between her London Sea articles and the editorial feature and advertising content of Good Housekeeping suggests perhaps that Wolfe knew enough about the publication to anticipate the type of articles and advertising material that might surround her contributions. And in the example of Great Men's Houses, I think we can also see her parodying one of the magazine's familiar forms, that of the Celebrity Homes feature. But we must own that many of the most interesting interactions outlined here are not authorial at all, they're editorial, or indeed they're simply coincidental. Um, and Sean Latham has talked about the greater affordance or action possibilities offered by magazines to the reader, um, by which he's saying, kind of, because when you read a magazine, the reader can make choices about how you read. You could read it sequentially from beginning to end, like a codex book, or it's more likely that you're just kind of flick through, that you might use the content, or you might just flick through and see what grabs your eye. You could choose from a large number of other possibilities of ways of reading, skimming and selecting, or um, reading backwards, or in any unconstrained order that you like. And this array of reading possibilities introduces elements of chance into the reading process, which increase the possibility of unintended patterns and meanings arising from the magazine's diverse content. So it is fortuitous, I think, I mean, but this is what kind of an editorial choice perhaps, that Great Men's Houses features in the special spring household number. I'd rather like that, that that's where it sits, that it sits in a, um, a number which has a particularly large amount of household engineering and housecraft articles, one of which is tools that eliminate drudgery, which considering um, the kind of discussion of Carlyle's wife and maid and the drudgery that they faced in the 19th century and kind of re-evaluating um, uh, sort of that desire to preserve anything of that era, I quite like the idea that one might flick from great men's houses to tools that live in electricity. Oh yes please, I'll have an electric toaster. Or one of those things to make your ties flat. <laughs> like, um, that, that, I don't know, how does that change our reading? I suppose it, it maybe enhances the idea that, uh, that, that Wolf's putting forward in that essay, that we might romanticise the past, but actually maybe there's a lot to be said for kind of moving forward, for getting rid of some of that drudgery. So this kind of uh, array of patterns and meanings arising from the magazine's interior and um, external periodical codes and also from what Latham calls these greater action possibilities, it's those I think that so greatly enrich our reading of these articles in their original place of publication. Um, and as well, hopefully they offer some valuable insights into how Wolf, Bloomsbury and modernist cultural aesthetics are present, debated, and critiqued within this mass market magazine. But you might read them from different. I just have a quick question because, um, you know, not having seen the other actual issues of the magazines, mm -hmm. but listening from your talk, and also just seeing the great men's houses, great men's houses, I was struck by the variety of different forms of illustration that go with Wolf's uh, writing. Yeah. And I was wondering if she chose how to say because if it's a magazine, you know, I don't want to read a magazine, flip through it and the images catch your eye and that it's often what makes you read the article. Yeah. Um, and when I was looking at reading the great men's houses article, I was also struck by the captions to the photographs, which are really quite like entertaining and a little bit sarcastic, like this one that says, um, even the garden at the back of Carlyle's house seems to be not a place of rest and recreation. But another small battlefield. Oh yes, yeah. 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 So it, and it sounds interesting. It, it, who wrote those captions? Yeah. Did did Wolf choose these in, uh, images that went with her articles? Did she have some say? Is this like an editorial sort of um, 
they're really supporting her in the sense of writing some sort of sarcastic um, captions and then having the home of, uh, home of poets in the same issue. I think it's all yeah. editorial. Um, I mean, she signs off her proofs, so she has seen what illustrations have been put, and I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I don't have the evidence to know, but I would assume it would be editorial. Um, because the captions are also quite... Yeah, they, I mean, because the, the captions are the quotes from within the essay, but oh, you're right, it's interesting what they choose to focus yeah. on. And I've covered up that photograph, but you're right, it is interesting that kind of like, look at this, uh, look at this backyard, it's a battlefield, and it looks completely desolate. Yeah. Um, but it looks like, you know, what I see on my location, location, location every week. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. The, that, the image is actually quite neutral, I think. Yes. It's right. a choice of the caption that makes it so desolate looking. And I think, this, I think it's the same issue, if not it's one either side, has um, an article on a very similar kind of house to um, this house in Chain Road that's saying how you can divide up a house into two flats, and it has almost the same photograph you saw. I think we might be reusing some of the, like, their stock photographs here. Um, yeah, it, I think, it, as you say, it's really interesting, the range of different types of illustration. Um, which is why I suppose it's that you can see that an editorial choice has been made to frame this essay so similar to a celebrity home feature using photographs rather than having etchings or having any of the other different styles that we find. I think I question about editorial choice is really interesting actually then thinking about Sean Nathan. Yes. That, that quote from Sean Nathan. Because, because having the, the last bit of each important article with the um, adverts forces the readers to make that choice. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a choice so much. You know, you're forced to read the end of each article in the context of the advertisements, which um, is really interesting actually in the sense that the reader doesn't have any, have any choice in how they read, read it in that sense. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, I found myself doing that as well. I mean, you sometimes become conscious of. Having to flip, you know, those pages over there. But yeah, it becomes a very yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It disrupts the reading process. Yeah, the kind of dragging you through. Yeah. yeah. An artificial break in the reading, mm. too. And I think there's some consciousness in the placing of um, adverts, too. I'm sure it's mostly about fitting the space. Because mm. um, I think you've got a different editor who's working with the advertising who knows you've got this column and you've got to fit this in. Um, but sometimes the overlaps you see with kind of the content and the advert, you think, like, I don't know, there's, there's sort of, in Harper's Bazaar, there's a, a wolf essay in which she's uh, into the looking glass. She's kind of, it's about um, an older woman reflecting on, oh my goodness, look at my life, look at this moment in my life, and look at myself, and why do I put up her front to the world, and why am I acting apart? And then it's next to this advert for cosmetic surgery, and she's <laughs> that sort of. Surely someone had a little bit of a laugh when they put that in the press. I don't know. Right, that's interesting, the way sometimes actually the reader maybe doesn't have the, the, doesn't have the, the choice. Once they've got you, you have to have yeah. the It's like that, I don't know what it's called, but the idea of pushing. Um, someone theorised recently about pushing people towards products that they might not necessarily think of. Uh -huh. um, and how magazines might be doing that as well. It's yeah. so actually pushing you towards kind of cosmetic surgery. Not Well, yeah, I mean, where, who made the decision about where the content went versus where the advert went? So, would someone have known, oh, Virginia Woolf's going to publish, so can we pay to have our advert next to her? Or can we pay to have it next to Violet Bon Carter? Depending on what the product was. So, like today, in newspapers, you get, well, if this is for about X. I think that would make sense, but I don't know whether it's going on in good housekeeping. I mean, a lot of the um, advertisers are the same advertisers, issue after issue, almost in the same places. Um, but it may well be, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't explored, um, I haven't explored kind of what's going on. It's quite difficult um, with good housekeeping still being a magazine that's ongoing. I've got to try to contact them and I've got absolutely nothing. <laughs> They've got some archive, they obviously don't want <laughs> anyone to look at it. Or they were, maybe they were, just weren't very interested when I was a first year PhD student going, please, 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 please. <laughs>
I wondered if you had any sense that um, the publication context informed the kinds of political statements she was making. Like, I'm just thinking of um, Oxford Street Times mm -hmm. and London and that idea of commercialism. Um, in other things that looked like the more than the 30s, commercialism has been about getting rid of the counter between the working classes and the middle classes. And I'm and you have a kind of class critique instead of an empowering middle class. You know, just about it. I mean, just anything like that. Right? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it is directed by where she's writing for. Yeah, I think it must be. Um, I think the other thing that maybe has a, a bearing is um, her meeting with Aldous Huxley. Um, just before she writes this article, so it's documented. If you've read, read um, the Docks of London in um, the Essays of Virginia Woolf in the footnotes, it tells you that uh, when the, the quote when she says, and I'm to write six articles about what, is from a diary entry in which she's talking about having had dinner with Alice Huxley and his wife Maria. And Alice Huxley is in London at the time because he's researching four articles for Nash's Palmar magazine. And one of those articles is on the docks of London, and another one <laughs> is on the Houses of Parliament. Um, he's writing a series of articles about kind of um, the social and economic problems that Britain is facing during the Depression. And she reflects in her uh, diary entry that Alice Huxley is so kind of, he's so engaged and he's doing so much stuff. Mm -hmm. And she says, and here I sit like a weevil in a biscuit. And I think she says, tossing around in bits of toilet paper or something. And she's really like, just completely <laughs> dismal about, oh, I'm so not in interesting. I'm not modern. I think she uses that term. And Alice Huxley is. So mm -hmm. it's clear that the theme for these essays, what she decides to choose about, to write about, is informed by. Huxley's interest in the economic problems, so maybe that answers your question too, and it's worth having a look at. I, I had a look at one of the Huxley essays, and there are some similarities, but I mean, she can't have read his essay, but they obviously talked about it at dinner, and yeah. that's quite interesting. The mammoth test has yeah. come up. Um, in Francis? Yeah. Really? yeah. Which Francis are you reading for, sir? Um, Nash's Palmer magazine. The essays are in um, David Bradshaw has an edited collection, I can't remember what it's called, of Huxley essays, but um, they're in there if you're interested. Talking or no, please. Uh, no, I was waiting for you to talk, and I didn't have to. Okay, um, thank you for looking. That was really enlightening. Um, I've been thinking about Vogue in the 1920s and Bell and Wolf and Blues be in Vogue as a sort of high bonus avant garde contribution. Dorothy Todd wanted to make it yeah. more of a high bar publication. But actually, after this point, Blues be art is becoming. Middle ground. Yeah. Um, and I, I was quite interested that you managed to avoid the word middle ground. <laughs> <laughs> I did, didn't I? Yeah, I did. <laughs> very nicely. Um, I was just sort of wondering, um, so this is a decade later, and the position of good housekeeping is obviously self consciously not high Um And so sort of what the position there is with middle ground. Um, and, and do they have original illustration as well? In, is it originally commissioned? Yes, yeah. they do. It's quite boring. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of very sentimental pictures of um, fans and children. Um, <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, Middleborough. So kind of where, where, where good housekeeping fits and, or, or why avoid the word, I suppose. Yeah, and I'm so, so really interested to doing that slippage between middle class and middle brow yeah. and where to draw those part of the lines. I think that's all too easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. I, um, I have written an article with middle brow in the title about this <laughs> <laughs> magazine, so I should be careful what I say. Um, but I think like, my idea about what middle brow is keeps changing all the time. I don't know about you. Yeah. It's like, um, and the point I suppose it's, that I think is sort of really important is that middle brow doesn't categorise any particular aesthetic moment. 
I mean, you can't say, um, you can't easily say anyway that this type of experimentalism is very clearly middle ground um, and not something else because there's so many overlaps. But I think middle ground, um, Fahan positions middle ground as uh, kind of a space in which high and low culture can be explored um, in a sort of knowing way. And I think that's what happens in good housekeeping, that um, there's a sort of shared knowledge that, yes, we know all that experimental stuff's very clever, but it's quite dull, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's an assumption that's running underneath. And also sometimes, and I would say that Vogue in the 20s, that's a middle rare exploration of um, modernism, that kind of well, you all know what those European isms are about, don't you? That's the sort of middle ground. Like, yeah, we all know that, but we're kind of I'm teaching you at the same time as I'm saying we all know it. Um, I'm not answering it very well. I don't know what you think. So, maybe <laughs> second question. And, yeah, I just sort of wanted to talk about yeah. the time, really. And, and it that's, a, that's a great answer, and I like the, yeah, it is now, it's like it might be. So, have, have you, sorry, this is what I cut out. Have you met, um, Love Berlant's The Female Complaint, she talks about intimate puppets. This is a really useful idea for thinking about um, mass market magazines and models them in, I think. So she defines an intimate public, um, I just love that term, is an intimate public operates when a market opens up to a block of consumers claiming to circulate texts and things that express those people's particular core interests and desires. And so she says, when this kind of culture of circulation takes hold, participants in the intimate public feel as though it expresses what is common among them, a subjective likeness that seems to emanate from their history and their ongoing attachments and actions. Sorry, I'm reading again, I should be doing this. <laughs> but that's, I think that's a useful idea. I think of middle ground as a type of intimate public. I mean, Bernard's using this for kind of women's culture as an intimate public. But we could also think about um, Charlie, Charlie Dawkins' work at MSA, he was talking about the spectator and kind of a conservative literary view on modernism. We can think about that as its own intimate public. So I guess how, we can think about how modernism is surveyed in lots of different cultural spaces rather than hom a homogenised idea of what mass culture is or what middle ground is. Actually, there's maybe a slightly different intimate public for good housekeeping than there is for Vogue, and I don't want to label them both exactly.